she looks so happy and cheerful in her dress. She's got green and red on and bright and you guys are all looking great. Uh, Gemma's back with her fantastic hats again. <laughs> She's got to bring the crazy hat every time. We love it. So, and welcome, Don. I think this is the first time I've seen you here, so we're very happy to have you, Duncan. Rita, good to see you again. Thank you for joining us again. And the dog. We have any kids in the audience today? No, oh, we got, got, <laughs> we got fake puppies. <laughs> so if any of you, um, I mean, if you've been checking your email today, you may have noticed that there was an additional tape talk added for this Friday, the 17th at noon. It is actually gonna be a hospitality focused taste talk. It's gonna talk a little bit about um, the hotel and lodging industry in Chicago and um, how it's seen downturns before, but how we've bounced back from that. So we're gonna talk about some of the um, things that have happened in the Chicago um, hotel market in the past and what we can kind of expect seeing in the future too. So that's going to be a really exciting talk. So we'd love for you to join us. And of course, um, tomorrow will be our very popular Thirsty Thursdays. And I have sent out with, along with that email with the flyer for Friday, I sent out the cocktails that will be made and the ingredients. So if you would like to make one or both of the cocktails that he's going to be demonstrating tomorrow, please make sure and check your email, scroll down, because it's the thing I have on the bottom, so it's worth the scroll, so you know what ingredients you need to have in order to make the cocktails that John will be featuring on Friday. So, all right, it's 12.05, so we are going to get started. Let me turn down the music, so. Uh, I'd like to welcome all of you to our Taste Talks. If you have not been to a Taste Talk before, you're in for a pleasant treat today, and we would love to see you again in the future. Um, as I mentioned, we do have tomorrow, Thirsty Thursday, 4.30 p.m. Uh, the Negroni and the Bulvedere will be the cocktails that John will be de demonstrating. And then we will have, again, Friday at noon, um, the hospitality hotel and lodging uh, lecture as well. And we have some exciting things coming up for next week too. So keep checking your emails to see when the flyer schedules for next week will be out. There's definitely some fun things coming with um, wine and cheese pairings and um, wine and sushi pairings. So it's gonna be um, lots of wine next week, which I am a big fan of myself. So if this is your first time joining us, I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Christine Duke. I'm the Continuing Education Program Manager at Kendall College. And I started the Taste Talks to kind of have a little fun education session for everyone in the Kendall and NLU community, but also um, the public who we like to reach out to, who we are um, hoping that soon we will be able to have you back in our kitchens learning again and many more exciting things coming from Kendall College as far as recreational classes in the future. But in the meantime, we can all be together on Zoom and learn all different kinds of things. If you have any topics that you're interested in learning from our culinary or hospitality faculty, please contact me at taste.nl.edu in order to put in any requests or any questions that you may have. And today we are very excited to have Lydia Burns joining us and she is an expert in specialty foods, specifically cheese. And she is going to be sharing with us how to make some amazing, delicious and beautiful cheese boards. So Lydia, please take it away. Hi, my name's Lydia and I've been working in specialty food uh, with a focus on cheese for the last 15 years. Um, in various places all over Chicago and New York and now I have my own consulting business called Savvy Squirrel Consulting and I also am really excited to be developing a specialty cheese elective course for Kendall for whenever the students are back on campus so uh, if there's any students out there hope to see you guys 
So today I wanted to talk about building a beautiful cheese board. And even though we can't be face to face in person, I've noticed definitely among my friends an uptick in people photographing their home meals as a way to connect to each other. And even before we found ourselves in this quarantine situation, cheese boards have been a really trendy thing to photograph and share on Instagram. And uh, it's great for us because it's rekindled interest in cheese and the way it's presented. Now that being said, I am definitely more old school. I am a taste first person, uh, beauty second. But that being said, I think there's a lot of ways to make a really functional, enjoyable cheese plate and then some tricks to make that just pop on the camera so you can make your friends extra envious. So I'm gonna start with the basics of how I would make a cheese board in general, just for enjoyment. Because like I said, I think it's really important that there are definitely varying schools of thought. Um, some people create beautiful food that isn't very practical or easily enjoyed, but that is not my approach. I wanna first make something that everyone can eat and enjoy. And second, you can photograph and show off to your friends. So, when creating a cheese board, the first thing that you have to consider is sourcing and a selection of cheeses that are gonna complement each other and contrast each other enough that it isn't too redundant. So the first step is buying your cheese. Now right now there are some added challenges to procuring products, but I definitely just wanted to shout out some local shops that are still available for pickup orders or delivery um, because I think first and foremost when we're talking about cheese, it is great to have really good quality cheese and good quality cheese doesn't always mean expensive. I know that's often the equation, but there's definitely ways to, to source high-end high cheese or good quality cheese and also be budget conscious. So I definitely recommend it's always best to ask the expert. And I know in these times that is difficult, but there are a lot of little shops where you can still either talk to someone on the phone or order online and chat with them. Uh, kind of depends on your level of comfort or interaction. But um, I live up in the Lincoln Square area there's a great little specialty shop called L&M. That is where I got most of the cheese today. And I supplemented with some cheeses from Trader Joe's. Again, another good way to keep the budget friendly is maybe you get a couple awesome tasty cheeses from your local grocery store or Trader Joe's and then supplement them with some really special standouts from a specialty shop. There's also in the Ukrainian Village area, a shop called All Together Now. They have a great cheese selection and they are also doing pickup and delivery orders. Brand new in Logan Square, a former colleague of mine just opened a cheese shop amidst this crisis. It's called Beautiful Rind uh, and they are doing pickup and delivery orders. I highly recommend checking them out. And they're also going to be doing some online cheese classes where you can buy a kit and then follow along at home. So that's another way to kind of get involved with cheese and interact at home. Now, and then there's also your local grocery stores. I think there, there's a great selection of cheeses to be had at Mariano's. I think they're also doing pickup orders. And um, there's Harvest Time up by me too. They also have a great selection of cheeses, especially if you go into their deli section, also available for pickup. So I encourage you to support some local shops so that they can still be around after all this. And they'll also be able to help you on the phone if you are having some anxiety about what to pick. It's always great to talk to a monger and they're still available for phone consultations. So I highly recommend that you check them out. That being said, I can give you some pointers right now on how to pick some cheeses. And of course, you always, I can give you rules, but ultimately you're the one enjoying this cheese plate. So you have to pick stuff that you enjoy uh, first and foremost. And I always say that variety is key. Traditionally, a lot of people think of 
well, different melts. If you're gonna have a cheese plate, and I recommend doing three to four at most, especially if this is just for you or you and your family. Sometimes you can get overwhelmed with too many things. Also, it gets a little crowded sometimes on, on the plate and for arranging, it's also better. I think sometimes less can be more. Um, so I usually say like three to four is a good number. And then you, you want to just have variety. But variety when it comes to cheese can come in a lot of different forms. You can have different milk types. Maybe you have, if you wanna be traditional, sort of follow the old French rules, you'll have a cow milk cheese, a goat milk cheese, a sheep milk cheese. But maybe you're not as interested in all of those categories, so that's perfectly fine. There's also a lot of ways you could have a cheese plate that is really varied in flavor, in flavor and texture, and it could all be cow's milk. Or alternatively, some people have sensitivities to cow milk cheeses. It could also alternatively be all goat's milk or all sheep's milk. I just encourage variety of flavor and texture. So it's nice to have, if you enjoy them, it's nice to have at least one soft cheese. Um, and then I tend to like aged cheeses. So I tend to have one or two soft cheeses and then usually go a little bit heavier on the semi-firm to firm cheeses. Uh, that's just a personal preference. Again, if you prefer soft cheeses to semi-soft, I think you can also skew your plate in that direction. Uh, it'll just kind of affect the way you present them, which we'll get to a little bit later. So I have four cheeses here today. Um, the one in the middle, this is called Campo de Montalban, and this is a Spanish mixed milk cheese. It's made from cow, goat, and sheep's milk very similar in style to a manchego. You can see the basket rind, which is always sort of a signature of traditional Spanish cheeses. And this is gonna be semi-firm, mild, easy snacking cheese, really easy to pair with different accompaniments. So I love to use this on a plate. I also have, this is a, a really fun, super flavorful crumbly cheddar from Trader Joe's. I believe it's called the, it has a strange name. I want to say it's unusual cheddar or unconventional cheddar, something un, but it's essentially a cheddar uh, with, that uses Parmesan culture. So it has a little bit more of a fruity flavor profile. Also great for snacking and fun to pair with a lot of different accompaniments. You can take this one kind of in a sweet direction or a savory direction, which I like to kind of play with both of those flavors. I also have another firm cheese here. This is called Pantaleo. This is one of my all time favorite cheeses. It is from the island of Sardinia in Italy. And this is an aged goat milk cheese and it has these really great lemony and peppery notes. So again, that one's gonna have a nice little tang. And then last for my soft cheese, have it on a little plastic so it doesn't mess up my board. Soft cheeses tend to make a mess when we work with them. So sometimes I just use the plastic wrap. Um, I just put cut a little square and put it under it to kind of help minimize the cleanup after. You don't have to if you're not into that, but just something I, I tend to do, especially for presentation purposes. This is a really soft blue cheese called Chiraboga Blue. And this is from Bavaria in Germany. And this is one of my favorite blue cheeses. It's also what I would call a great gateway blue or beginner blue. It's really mild. And I find that even people sometimes who are tentative about blues can really enjoy this cheese because it just has a touch of that traditional blue spice. And as you can see, there's very minimal veining in it. So this is not a, this is not a really pungent blue cheese. It almost tastes more like room temperature cultured butter, which is probably why I love it so much. Uh, just really rich and unctuous with just a little bit of bite from that blue molding. And the reason this is milder is because it's a very young blue cheese. Um, it's actually, blue cheeses are, uh, they're inoculated with the molds when they're made in the vat. And then in order to encourage the molds to grow, as you might know if you are a blue cheese fan, they often kind of appear in lines, 
within the paste of the cheese, the blue molds. And that's because after the cheeses have aged a little bit, those cheeses are pierced with needles and the molds are aerobic. So they don't grow unless there's air present. So as soon as those little channels are made in the cheese, the, the blue mold can populate inside the cheese. And this particular cheese is pierced and then it's pretty much wrapped and packed up to ship to the States, which takes about a month uh, because it is coming from Europe on a container ship. So this cheese actually sees most of its aging in transit to us in the United States, which is why it is really mild. It's kind of a fun little fact. So, Usually my first tip for creating a cheese board is to prepare your cheeses on a different board than what you're presenting on. Because a lot of times you're gonna get little smears, little crumbles, and then that way it's just really easy to prep it and then transfer it to the board that you've selected. I have this guy today over here. I'll hold it up when, when we have some stuff on it but I'm gonna prep on this guy over here, kind of try to show you guys some pointers. So my first pointer in prepping cheese boards is that you wanna work with the cheese, you don't wanna fight it. So what I mean by that is sometimes you have an idea in your mind like, oh, I wanna cut this, this soft cheese into perfect little wedges. Well, the reality is, is that with soft cheeses, once you cut them, they tend to morph a bit and ooze, especially if you have tempered them, which the other thing for enjoying cheese is that you should temper them before you serve them because all the flavors come out when the cheese reaches room temperature. So these cheeses have all been sitting out about an hour, uh, which is definitely what I recommend. It depends on the temperature of the where you're prepping, if you're outside, you'll need, and it's warm, unlike today, uh, you'll definitely need less time. Like if you're prepping for a summer picnic, you probably only need them to be out a half an hour or less because you don't want them to get too sweaty. But indoors, my apartment's pretty low temperature, probably around 68 degrees. So if anything, you can air on the end, on the, the longer end of things. So I typically say an hour is a really good time. So all of these are already tempered which in the case of hard cheeses makes them easier to cut. In the case of soft cheeses can sometimes make them a little bit more tricky. So my first rule I'm starting is that A, if you're using a blue cheese, use a separate knife because the blue flavors will sort of populate on the knife. And then if you go and cut some of the other cheeses, you might get some of those flavors. So I would definitely say with soft cheeses in general, it's better to use a different style of knife. For harder cheeses, I always just say a, like, a chef's knife is really the best. Um, you don't need a special knife. The most important thing is that it's sharp. So a chef knife or whatever you have on hand that's a really nice sharp knife is gonna be best for those hard cheeses. And for soft cheeses, the, you actually want as little surface area as possible. This is a, this is a special soft cheese knife. Um, or sometimes you've seen these knives with holes in them. Those are also designed for soft cheese because essentially when you're cutting through a soft cheese, it's gonna stick to the blade. So the less amount of surface area you have, the less sticking there is, or again, with those holes, those also help to sort of, uh, to help to not have the sticking effect so much. So with soft cheeses, I say less is more. Because again, the more you cut it, the more it's sort of going to morph. And what ends up happening is it looks like a pile of goo. So this was wrapped in plastic. So you often get this little sort of unclean edge. So I always just cut that off. And of course, I always snack on all the little bits I don't put on the plate. You should definitely eat them, even though they don't make it to the presentation. But then working with soft cheeses, I always like to leave things in a bigger piece because again, it's, they're just gonna kind of morph. And then I typically also put something on the board to serve it with um, so that people can kind of cut their own pieces. And with cheeses that are this soft, that's really easy. You can even use a little spreader. Um, so I usually say maybe two cuts is the most you're gonna wanna do. 
And so I just did two nice little wedges. And again, you can kind of do your cleanup on your prep board. Get all these little pieces out. And then you can arrange, which I will show you in a minute. Also good to always have a little wet paper towel on hand, both for yourself and for wiping any plates that you're going to take pictures of. So we started with that again, not using that knife anymore since it does have, as you can see, blue cheese stuck all over it. So now we're moving on to the hard cheeses. With the hard cheeses, it's not as imperative to use a new knife since again, it doesn't, they don't really stick to the, the knife the same way that the blue cheese does. This guy, let me try to see if I can lift this up to show you guys a little bit. So hopefully we can see. So this is, hold it up here, a really classic sort of style of, uh, you'll, a lot of cheeses come in this format where it's just like a five pound wheel and you get these nice little wedges when you buy them at the store that are little triangles. So little trick for cutting these cheese for presentation is that just use the shape. We're gonna cut a bunch of little nice triangles. And another thing to bear in mind, this particular rind is not edible. It's a plastic poly coat. Um, which a lot of manchegos are. And um, so I like to leave the rind on for presentation, but it's always good to note which rinds can and can't be eaten. Most rinds are edible. It's just a matter of if you like the taste, especially on harder cheeses, they tend to have a little bit of an earthy flavor. Um, so I always tell people to try them and then if they like them, you should eat them. If not, don't. Uh, with soft cheeses though, the rinds are intended to be eaten, like a brie, when you have that top rind, that is part of the flavor, and it's actually the hardest part of the cheese to cultivate. So I know some people like to scoop it out. Again, you gotta do whatever you enjoy, but I definitely recommend trying it, because that is definitely part of the experience. So in this case, I've just cut this down the middle, um, and then I'm gonna take this guy, and I'm gonna just cut about quarter inch triangles. And these are the secret weapon when it comes to presenting a really nice cheese plate. And they're also really portion perfect. If you have multiple people, that's a nice little piece for someone to take on their plate. Again, for me, function always comes first, then form. So just kind of cut a bunch of these. Again, really sharp knife is gonna be the most important part. And you're just gonna work against the rind and then you're gonna end up with this butt piece. But I do encourage everyone to get as close to that rind as possible because the cheese is totally edible up until that point. So we don't wanna waste it. And again, I sort of shave off this little working piece and snack on it usually. So then you have these really nice triangles, which are great for presenting. Uh, they kind of, you can sort of do little circles with them. I don't know if you guys can see that. Can you hold that up all so we can see? Great, thank you. They're gonna fall a little bit, but <laughs> I'll, I'll also bring it around at the end. So these are just really great for pre presentation. All right, and then move on to this guy, our little block cheddar. So this cheese is, as most cheddars are, because of the way they're made, they tend to be really crumbly, and that's because of the way they're made is a process called cheddaring. If you've ever had a cheese curd, um, that is a product of the cheddaring process, which means initially the cheese is cut into little grains about rice size in the back, and then they are formed into slabs, and then those slabs are cut into curds, which then go into the mold. Um, so that's why you might notice when you have cheddars that sometimes they have, they kind of fissure and frack, uh, break in little lines, and you see these little round sort of things. And that's because of cheddaring. So something very common with cheddar, when you sort of go 
if you take your knife and just sort of pop it out, so you get these, I don't know if it shows up on the screen. Try that. It's hard with these white cheeses, but see how it's sort of textured? That's because, uh, again, it's gonna break along those lines. So, again, don't fight it. I like to work with it. So often what I'll do is just kind of take my knife and allow it to do those little bit of breaks. Kind of get like a nice rustic crumble. And I just let, let it do that. Don't fight it. Also makes it easier for people to serve. All right. Can, Lydia, can you use your, um, your phone camera to kind of oh, show yeah. the overhead how it's looking? Oh, yeah. She has, she has her phone also hooked up here. So if you see the other Lydia Burns there, you can see what she's. Yeah. So on. there it is. So I like to start building all my boards with the cheese first because the cheese is really the focus, right? Um, and then in this particular case, sort of eventually I'll flip it around, but the way it looks right now, we're going to from mildest to most intense flavor-wise. You don't have to do that. It's just sort of ingrained in me uh, as sort of a hazard of the profession. Then we get to the fun part, which is you get to fill in all these gaps with some accompaniments. So I'll hold this back up in a sec. I'm just gonna swap this out. So I always think when we're talking about cheese boards, I like to pick a theme, uh, especially if you really want to make an impactful image. So today I was kind of envisioning an alfresco in the house <laughs> cheese plate. Also trying to work with what I have on hand. I don't have a lot of the usual things I would make with the cheese plate. So I decided to kind of see what I have, what inspired me. So today I have a lot of fresh vegetables I need to use up. So I cut up some crudite, got some radishes and some orange bell peppers. And I'm gonna use those to decorate the plate and help the spread. I thought since this blue cheese reminds me of cultured butter, one of my favorite snacks is radishes with salted butter. So, no salt necessary here. The blue cheese is nice and salty. So I'm gonna fill in this board with these radishes and I think it'll go delicious. For me, I'm a little literal. So also another little presentation tip, even though we usually don't eat these little green parts on the radish, they look really nice in a picture. And because cheese tends to all be this sort of uniform, different shades of beige, I do like to try to pick accompaniments that have a pop of color, um, but also still, again, taste good and go with the, what we're eating. So in this case, you get the nice little pop of color from the radish, but still tastes really good together. And I always like to put accompaniments with the thing, accompaniments paired to the items um, yes, we want them to look beautiful, but again, I really think that they should taste great together. So I was thinking peppers would look, would taste amazing with this cheddar. And then I have this grainy mustard, kind of just looks black in this bowl, but it's, um, pickled mustard seeds. And, um, I'm really more of a savory person. So I tend to go more savory with my accompaniments. That being said, this cheddar does have a sweetness. So this is also a really great opportunity to use, you know, something sweet. If you like a jam, um, I do have these little, this little uh, 
jar of jam. I, uh, one of my favorite things to do when I'm traveling is steal, well not steal, because they're part of the brunch, but uh, take the little jars of jams and honey that you get. Um, I'm also a honey freak and it's one of my favorite things to get. So I also recommend, especially for blue cheeses, stinky cheeses, goat, fresh goat cheeses, anything with a little bit of pungency to it, honey is going to be a great tool to um, help sort of balance that, that bit of funk is a little bit of sweetness. So it's always great to drizzle a little bit of honey on top there too. Um, and then in the case of this Campo to Montalban, I actually, I know I said I like savory, which I do, but I also think this particular cheese, because it has a little bit of a buttermilky flavor, goes really well with strawberry. So I have this little bit of strawberry jam I took from a hotel in Champagne, <laughs> just waiting for this occasion. And so again, it's nice to, uh, you know, these little jams are great because they can just go right on the board. And then it's always nice if you have any nuts. I only have walnuts right now, but nothing wrong with that. To kind of fill in the empty spaces with any sort of filler. And then I'd say the only thing this board is missing at this point is maybe some sort of vehicle. Again, I am a little short on accompaniment. So I have these pretzel chips. And since this is a Bavarian blue chip cheese, I thought they'd be pretty tasty with that. So I don't, there we go. I don't like to overcrowd the board too much. I know on Instagram, there's a really popular trend where you see these like really decadent, really bountiful cheese boards that are just packed with product. And I think they look really great for photos. But again, the end, if the end destination is your own enjoyment, those boards are impossible to eat off of. So I like to keep it a little simple. And then the trick to really selling the presentation, I think, is sometimes the setup. So in that case, it's really fun to, if you have a lot of props, fun plates, even um, some nice linens, those are really gonna like help sell it. So I'm gonna set up a little shot now, but I can answer questions while you guys do that, and then I'll kind of show you the end result. Absolutely. So if you have any questions, please um, type them in the chat. So I have a couple of questions already. Um, yeah. One person asked, uh, how many ounces per person would you recommend for a cheese board? So, I mean, again, it depends on the, the amount of cheeses you have. And there's always a little bit of someone's going to like one cheese more than others. So if this board is indeed your lunch and the main component, I usually say, like in this case, if you have three cheeses, I would say you want to do about an ounce and a half to two ounces of cheese per person per cheese. But again, that's if that's your meal. If this is just going to be a snack, I definitely say you could go down to one ounce. Um, but yeah, since this is kind of the idea of this board is a, a lunch, um, I would definitely err on the end, on the higher end. Also, I just eat a lot of cheese. So. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I usually say that like, and then if you were doing, you know, if it was just a starter and you were serving a lot of other food, I'd definitely say, you know, if you're doing three cheeses, an ounce per cheese is gonna, it's gonna be a decent amount. It's maybe a little more than a lot of people would eat, but then there's usually someone who will kind of do the heavy lifting for everyone else. So it ends up working out. Okay. And then um, we did we did have a question we wanted to go through the cheeses that you had one more time because i was unable to type them out out forever so i know there was the pantaleo correct yes p-a-n-t-a-l-e-o okay and then the manchego was that a specific manchego or it's actually not a manchego it's called campo de montalban campo de montalban um because manchego has to be all sheep's milk cheese. Uh, so this is made in that style, but with the mixed milk. Okay. 
and then the the chatter and i apologize i did not catch all the names i was trying to keep everyone's uh, getting oh, those questions sorry. taken care of so that was the the unconventional unusual something something like that it's from trader joe's okay it's on something cheddar they don't have very many so you'll be able to find that one pretty easily okay and was and was there one more and then there is the blue cheese the chiraboga blue my all-time favorites and that's a bavarian blue cheese very mild blue cheese Okay. And another thing when styling, because, you know, we're talking about Instagram, it's important. I think it always helps to have some sort of linen. I like, sounds silly, but I like to style in a, fun, in a functional way. So I like it to look like it's interactive, like some people are eating off of it, uh, because I just think it tends to read better. I mean, it helps if you're actually eating it before you get too deep into it. I tend to like make a couple bites and then sort of just style accordingly. So I might take this one cheese and then drizzle the accompaniment we have paired with it on it. Yeah, people love to see that assemblage of everything. So. Yeah, and then it's just sort of like a little bit of uh, context too. Mm -hmm. Um, it, makes, it makes you feel like you're actually part of the um, entertaining factor as well. You feel like yeah, and I think like again for these overhead shots, which are really trendy, but they also just work really well for um, for cheese plates in specific. Uh, also, plants are nice little props. I like to throw those in there. If you have mm -hmm. them, especially little mini ones, and uh, just kind of fun to. Um, you know, well, you can ultimately enjoy it after. I definitely recommend doing that. But then you also just kind of gives it the sense of a more, you know, natural environment. And usually when I'm taking photos of things, it's right before I eat them or right as I start eating them anyway. So it's also an easy way to incorporate that. And then we get these nice little spreads. Beautiful seeing some applause so you know you can definitely play with the angles yeah and then you can always expand out i have my knife here knives are great accompaniments are great little accessories too i have a lot of knives so i love these pocket knives because you can also kind of use them bent or straight it gives them a little bit of dimension Again, the challenge with cheese sometimes is that they're all the same color. So it helps to have little, little things to break it up, to sort of give it dimension. And our peppers match this little, this little blank, uh, little cheesecloth too. Didn't intend that, but it just worked. So yeah, then you can get these fun little shots. So. That's great, I love that. So, and definitely, you know, when when shooting things, I mean, here I am stepping in as this. Is you probably, I usually do the styling and then <laughs> someone else does the photos, so. Yeah, so. So always, I highly recommend if you are going to be taking any pictures of cheese displays or if you're making yourself a charcuterie board or even just taking a picture of the plate of the dinner you made or bread that you bought, um, bake the best lighting that you can use is natural sunlight so if you have the ability to to have any sun in your uh, coming in from your windows or okay okay or if you have something on a plate a plate's purpose is to move it from place to place so you can always step outside get a quick photo and bring it back in again so um sunlight is your best friend when shooting things and especially with cheese i don't know much about photography but i do know again because of those muted tones like right now, I do have a lamp on, but really pretty much all this light is coming from my windows over here. So that does help to kind of differentiate because the main difference 
is like there's a slight gradation in these cheeses, but really it's um it's mostly just uh the difference in textures. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the sunlight really helps to kind of you can if you're doing close ups, you can definitely see some of the variation. So it just helps a little bit. The overhead uh bright light sometimes obstructed even more because it kind of gets glossy and it just kind of all looks like a wash of beige. Yeah, so getting in the, the slight details and um, some of the shadows created by the cheeses is really important. And softer lighting, like sunlight, will actually help you with that and make it look really bright still at the same time. So, all right. Well, I think we've covered all the questions. Um, do you, actually, Lydia, do you, uh, do you have an Instagram that you share lots of your um, cheese displays and other different things on? I have a personal one. <laughs> I've done some, some of my professional stuff is on there. Um, I'm sort of, it's, it's very small. Like I said, I'm sort of new to the Instagram world, but it is stinky squirrel. S-Q-U-I-R-L, <laughs> not spelled properly. But I do have a couple, I did a photo spread for uh, French cheese Conte, that's on there. And uh, I'll probably take some of these and put them on there too. So. Yeah, absolutely. You should make use of that. Of course, you're going to eat it, but definitely grab it. them. Going to be my lunch before you have lunch. So, <laughs> well, thank you, Lydia. This has been such a delight. I, I love it. I really want. Oh wait, I have one more question. Yeah. Uh, how? Is, what is the best way to store cheese? Oh, this is a great question. Um, I actually meant to say that. So, especially at a lot of these markets, the ones I recommended. I forgot to mention Olivia's in Wicker Park as well. They're also a great little shop. They tend to cut and. If a shop is cut to order, which Beautiful Rind and All Together Now is, but most of them are pre-cuts, especially if you're going to grocery stores, and they come in plastic wrap. The main reason that is, is not because that's what's best for the cheese, but it's because it allows you to see the cheese. Mm -hmm. So my recommendation is, if you're not gonna eat that cheese right away when you get home, unwrap the cheese from the plastic wrap because it does absorb that plastic flavor and then there's a couple different alternatives. Most cheese paper is ideal, but most people don't have cheese paper in their house. Like there is a company called Formaticum, which you can order online and they sell cheese paper. They also sell, these are my favorite. They make these little bags for cheese and you can label them. These are great. But if you don't need one more thing in your kitchen, like most of us, um, you can wrap them in parchment paper and then wrap them in plastic wrap. The main thing is you don't want the plastic to contact the face because it absorbs that flavor. Again, if you're eating it later that day or the next day, it's probably not paramount that you unwrap it. But if you're gonna hold on to it for a while, I definitely recommend doing the parchment and then the plastic. Or what's probably the easiest and best is to unwrap it and put it in a little Tupperware container or deli. If you have like the little takeout delis, those are great uh, if you wash them. You don't like, uh, if you keep those, just give each cheese its own little container because cheese likes to breathe and that makes its own little environment. So, you know, especially like you don't want to co-mingle them. You could maybe do some harder cheeses, like if you have a cheddar and a Alpine or like a Manchego style, it's probably fine if you put them in the same container. But again, for the soft cheeses, the blue cheeses, definitely want to keep those separate but you can just pop them in those little delis and uh, you don't have, you just unwrap it, put it in there and put the lid on it and it'll be really happy in there. And even if you say, I don't finish my cheese plate and I have these little wedges, these in particular are gonna suffer because they have more surface exposure. So these just throw them in a deli, keep them in your fridge for when you want a snack later. So. Okay, fantastic. Yeah. So um, any other final words for us before we part? No? Thank you guys for tuning in. Yeah, well, thank you so much, Lydia. This was quite a delight. And um, we hope to, we're, we're planning something for the future, you and I. So we will definitely have Lydia coming back with something else with cheese in the future. So stay tuned um, to see what she's got coming up. And again, thank you everyone for joining us for the Taste Talks. Uh, we really, ooh, a cheese tip, that old Costco pizza in the fridge, zip it up, add some milk to soften it, make big meatballs. 
Don, I am loving this idea of using the old pizza to make meatballs later on. Great tip, thank you. Um, always excited to share different kinds of tips and uh, help you guys have a little bit of entertainment during the day, but a little bit of education as well. And I hope to see some of you tomorrow at Thirsty, for, Thirsty Thursday, 4.30 against the Negroni and the Bulbadier that we will be featuring. And if you have any questions on this topic, any other topics at all, please reach out to me at taste at nl.edu and I will see you guys again on Zoom. Thanks everyone, bye. Thanks.